Okay, we have a message here this morning that was actually a request of a listener. Um, he heard the message about Satan doesn't rule hell, God does, and he said, you ought to do a whole message sometime on common scripture misconceptions. Things that people think that the Bible teaches that the Bible really doesn't. And so I kind of thought about it. I actually had been planning that for a little while, and I thought, you know, I'm going to put something together on that. So that's what we're going to be doing this morning. We're going to look at some things that the Bible does not teach, but yet a lot of people have been led to believe. Okay, now there are two different types of unscriptural things that people fall for. First of all, there are words that people use, but they're not found in the King James Bible. And people think that they're scriptural, that they're okay. And they're not. We're going to look at that first. The second thing is verses that are taken out of context and misunderstood. That's another one that you're going to hear of. Okay, so we're going to start out here. Words that are not found in the King James Bible. This is one of my favorite ones. The word Catholic. Not in the King James Bible. It's actually not in any Bible that I'm aware of. You know, I've probably 70 different Bibles out there in my office right now, and none of them say Catholic. Okay? And here we have the Strong's Concordance, which is a really good tool for Bible study. It's a good thing. Stay away from the Greek and Hebrew. Dr. Strong was part of the American Standard Version Translation Committee. He was not a Bible believer. Okay? Just stay away from the Greek and Hebrew. But the point is, you can look up words in your King James Bible and see... The first reference, the law of first mention that we talk about here, oftentimes the first time a word is mentioned, it'll define it in the context. Okay, That's important to do. You can do word studies. Not Greek or Hebrew, but English word studies. And you'll learn a lot, by the way. Don't be fooled by this thing that you have to go back to the original languages to get nuggets of gold. That's nonsense. You can get it from the English language. Okay, It's, it's just amazing some of the things in there. But look up, whenever you have somebody say a word and they're saying that this is somehow spiritual, you should look it up in your King James Bible. Look it up in the Strong's Concordance, and you'll and if it's not in there, eh, it's probably not of God. Okay, now Catholic is obvious, you know, obviously that wouldn't be in there. But it's kind of interesting because you go down through the list there, the two words there, caterpillars and cattle. I thought that was kind of interesting. In other words, it goes caterpillars, cattle. Catholic would be right in between there and doesn't appear. Uh, but I kind of thought about that you know, as kind of an interesting two words there. Caterpillars, it's kind of like the Catholic clergy. They're worms. And then the people are the cattle, <laughs> the followers. Kind of lines up. What about none? How many times does, it, does the word none appear? Zero. It goes from... Uh, actually, no. The, there are references to none. I didn't look at that right. Joshua, the son of none. <laughs> none was a man. <laughs> okay, there are no uh, celibate women, you know, called nuns in the Bible. Doesn't work. What about monk? Here's another interesting <laughs> two words that monks should appear between: money changers and monsters. <laughs> kind of interesting. <laughs> um, what about Eucharist? Zero. Surprise, surprise. Eubulus and Eunice. It's kind of interesting there because Eubulus was a friend of Paul and Eunice is the mother of Timothy. Okay, but there's no Eucharist. What about transubstantiation? Nope. No transubstantiation. And this is interesting too, the two words, transparent and trap. <laughs> Very interesting. I, I found this kind of a uh, neat thing here. What about sacrament? The two words there, sacks, sacks and sacrifice. So that's kind of interesting too. How about uh, Pope? Poorest and poplar. But no Pope in between those two. What about monstrance? Do you know what a monstrance is? Everybody know what that is? A monstrance, you don't see it as much here in America because they can't get away with it. But like Central America, South America, countries that are almost all Catholic, they will have processionals where the priests will walk out. They have the, the cookie, you know, the, the Eucharist host, and they put it in this big, usually it's solid silver or gold. It's a, it's a stand, looks like a candlestick, but then it goes up and it has like sun rays coming off of it. 
You see, that's the system. It's a, it's Baal worship. It's sun worship. And they put the cookie right in the center of the thing, and then they carry it in a processional, and they'll have a guy doing the incense, you know, and stuff. And they'll carry that thing down the streets of a city, and the people bow down to it. We saw it. We were down in, in Costa Rica the one time. They were they had a processional, went down the street. And people were out, you know, doing work, and they'd see the, the processional coming. They'd drop to their knees, you know, as the thing was going by, praying. I thought... Do you realize how absurd this is? A bunch of guys in robes walking by carrying a cookie enshrined in silver and you're bowing to it? But that's what they do. Okay? But is the word monstrance, is that in the Bible? <laughs> surprise, surprise. No, it isn't. It stands between monsters and month. <laughs> or it would. What about penance? No. You do something wrong as a Catholic, you have to do penance. Uh, good deeds for the church and penance oftentimes is accompanied by money you know your sins are forgiven quicker if you you know do better penance okay and the word there would be pen and pence in your strongest concordance no penance in between what about purgatory no uh, pure and purge are the two words in your king or in your strongest concordance no purgatory in between them I heard it said the one time, another way to spell purgatory is B-A-L-O-N-E-Y. <laughs> Baloney. Uh, what about indulgence? No, there's no indulgence. We're going to be talking about indulgences a little bit later. But the two words there are inasmuch and incense. Now let me just make a point before we continue here. You would think that if Christ had a true church, and the true church was centered in Rome... You would think that the words that they use as their main descriptions of their faith, you'd think that they'd be based on Scripture. And they're not. The Roman Catholicism is the ancient pagan Roman Empire stealing words from the Bible and making it into a religion. Okay? That's all it is. It's a political power. I mean, what other church denomination, if you want to go by that, what other church denomination has world leaders coming and bowing down before the head of it and kissing his foot or kissing his ring. You're not dealing with a religious system. You are dealing with a powerful political organization. And they even teach it in their own writings. I have books out there in my office by Jesuits, and they actually say that they have spiritual power and temporal power. They have the sword of the spirit and the sword of warfare. You say, oh, but I don't see Catholic armies going out and attacking countries. They do it secretly. It's behind the scenes. But that's another study. Uh, let's get back into some words here, not in the King James Bible. Here's one that might surprise you. How many times does the word nice appear? You, know, you should be nice. You tell somebody off about the new versions or whatever, and they say, you're not nice enough. You know how many times it appears? Zero. The word nice is not in your King James Bible. Hmm. Kindness, meekness, gentleness, yeah, those are in there. But nice? Nope. Not in there. The two words there are Nicanor and Nicodemus. Okay? No nice in between them. Very interesting. How about the word coincidence? You hear people say, well, I don't believe, you know, it was just a coincidence. Is it in the King James Bible? No, not in the King James Bible. Cogitations and cold are the two words there. There's no coincidence in between them. And uh, if you're a Bible believer, you'll understand that nothing happens by chance. Nothing. And that's positive and negative, by the way. Okay, Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them which love God, to them uh, who are the called according to His purpose. I couldn't think if it was which or who. Yeah, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Okay? Whatever happens in your life, God has a plan. Now, you might sin, and that's not God's perfect will for your life, and God's going to have to punish you. But God still has a plan for your life. God still is going to lead and direct. Okay? And the best thing that you can do is try to find out what His direction is for your life and submit to it. When you say, oh, I'm going to do my own thing, do my own, go my own way, not a good idea. Uh, 
I remember Dr. Ruckman said the one time, one of the best things he ever said, and I just I put that into my brain, never forget it. He said, the worst thing that God can do to you is to let you have your way. <laughs> yeah. Amen to that. All right, what about the word conspiracy? Is conspiracy in the Bible? People say, oh, that's ridiculous. No, no, it couldn't be. Conspiracy is not in the Bible. You know, these conspiracy theories and stuff, it's not in the Bible. Uh, actually, yes, it is. The word conspiracy appears ten times. Conspirators, one time, and conspired, 19 times. Interesting. That is a Bible word. So why is it that you have so many Christians that you bring up conspiracy theories and they instantly shut off? I don't want to, no, I don't want to even hear about it. I don't even want to study it. We well, should. It's a Bible word. And if you think that Satan is doing everything out in the open and not plotting behind the scenes, you are quite foolish. <laughs> Okay, Satan and his followers are doing a lot behind the scenes. Not going to get into all that. Now I want to look at two more words here. And these are words that a lot of Christians have as part as their vocabulary. And you really need to be careful. Because these are both very popular among occultists. And these are leeching into professing Christianity. What about the word community? Is community in the Bible? Nope. It goes from commu communion to compact. Community does not appear in your King James Bible. But guess what? The NIV has replaced the word congregation with community. The old NIV took, I think, all but two of the references to congregation out and replaced it with community. The TNIV took all references to congregation out and said community. I don't know about the 2011 NIV. I haven't checked that one yet. But the point is, if I say to you, the whole congregation came together this weekend, what do you think about? You think about saved people, don't you? Right. Yeah. If I say the whole community came together this weekend, what do you think about? The whole town. The town. Yeah. Saved and lost. What is the average modern church today? A community. Exactly. It's the saved and lost coming together. Be real careful about that. I've, I have a video um, where they were talking about, they are quoting a lot of the prominent uh, occultists of the 20th century, like Alice Bailey and, and some of these others. And they said in her book, she said about, we need to create community over and over again. We need to create community. And you read Rick Warren, he says the exact same things. We need to create community. You know, and I, that's another message I have coming up here. The the language, they're changing the language in the modern churches. And change, not only are they changing the Bible, but they're changing the language. Now it's not saved and lost, it's churched and unchurched. Right. And it's just like, where's this stuff at in Scripture? See, they're changing the vocabulary. They're changing the words. They're changing the meaning. And we're going to see why that's a bad thing here in just a little bit. Now, here's another one. And this one's very interesting. How many times does the word human appear in your King James Bible? Zero. The word human is not in there. It goes from holda to humble. But you know what's interesting? The new versions are changing the word man to human being. And I'm going to tell you something else that's interesting. I have here a quotation from uh, the Secret Teachings of All Ages, an encyclopedic outline of Masonic, Hermetic, Kabbalistic, and Rosicrucian symbolic philosophy by Manly Palmer Hall. Manly Palmer Hall, if you don't know, was a very high-level Mason. He was the man that wrote about the master mason when he, he gets to a certain point that the seething energies of Lucifer are his to command. I mean, that's an exact, that's what he wrote. Okay? I mean, study the guy. He's a high-level Masonic uh, philosopher. You know, and this was not a Christian website that I got this off of, by the way. I, you know, occasionally, I don't recommend everybody does that, but occasionally I'll get into an occult website and I'll find quotes like this. Okay, but let's... Before I read that quote, I just want to show here Webster's 1828 Dictionary, the word human. It is actually in here, believe it or not. 
He says, I am not certain which are the radical letters of this word, but, an inclined, an, but am inclined to believe that to be uh, MN, that the first syllable is a prefix, that homo in Latin is contracted, the N being dropped in the nominative and restored in the oblique cases. Hence, homo and the Gothic and Sax gruma, a man, may be the same word, but this is doubtful. And then he goes on to say about, and he's saying, I really don't know where this thing came from. And he's trying to say that it's probably homo, as in homo sapien and man, and that you combine the, tri the two. But wouldn't that be ho-man? Yeah. Why is it a you? Hugh-man. I mean, right there, Webster's 1828, and he's saying, I don't know where the word came from. Well, I'm going to show you where I believe it came from. This is Manly Palmer Hall here, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It says, quote, their temples with wherein the sacred fire was preserved were generally situate on eminences and in dense groves of oak. He's talking about the Druids, the ancient Druidic people, the witches, basically. Uh, because a circle was the emblem of the universe, oval in allusion to the mundane egg from which issued, according to the traditions of many nations, the universe, or according to others, our first parents, serpentine, because a serpent was the symbol of hue. H U. Hugh was a Druidic god. Hmm. Keep reading. The Druidic Osiris, cruciform because a cross is an emblem of regeneration or winged to represent the motion of the divine spirit. Their chief deities were reducible to two, a male and a female, the great father and mother, Hugh and Cridwin, distinguished by the same characteristics as belonging to Osiris and Isis, Bacchus and Cirrus, or any other supreme goddess representing the two beings, or two principles of all being. So where did it come from? The occult. Hugh is a druidic god. Let me finish here. It says, uh, this is Manly Hall still, uh, quote, Godfrey Higgins states that Hugh the Mighty, regarded as the first settler of Britain, came from a place where the Welsh triads call the summer country the present site of Constantinople. Albert Pike, another Masonic philosopher, um, says that the lost word of masonry is concealed in the name of the Druid god Hugh. The meager information extant concerning the secret initi initiations of the Druids indicates a decided similarity between their mystery school and the schools of Greece and Egypt. Hugh, the sun god was murdered and after a number of ordeals and mystic rituals was, re was restored to life. Are you a Hugh man? Hmm. And how many of us use that as part of our normal vocabulary? I mean, watch some of my older videos on YouTube, probably listen to some of my older sermons. I was saying it. And the Lord kind of brought this to me and said, what's the deal with all these new versions are saying human, 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 human. Where'd this come from? And I thought, well, you know, I'll look it up in Webster's and he says, I don't know where it came from. And so I did some research and I just typed into the internet. I mean, you can do it yourself. It's not really some secret thing. You just type in Hugh. What's the word Hugh? H-U. And it'll take you to occult writings about this deity of the, that the Druids worshipped. Very interesting. And one of the most popular new versions out there right now is the Common English Bible, I think it's called, the CEB. I did a video on it showing that the translators, a couple of them are Jesuits. They don't even cover it up. You know, guys graduating from Loyola University, openly professing Roman Catholic priests, and the one guy's a Jesuit. They just stick it on their website now. They're so bold. You know, people are so bold in their sin. And that one translation they are replacing the son of man in reference to jesus christ you know the son of man they replace it with the human one so you know i don't i'm not going to fight about the differences of the new versions you know it's not that big of a deal oh yeah it is it's a huge deal and i and, you know people well you can get saved out of the new versions well you're on very shaky ground there and I'm telling you, a lot of these new versions, they are changing Jesus Christ of the King James Bible to the Antichrist. And you're going to have this new Christ who is the Hugh Man One. It's right there.
They're presenting a false Christ. Okay? Uh, just give you a couple examples here. King James Bible. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. The TNIV. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator, mediator between God and human beings, Christ Jesus himself, human. Christ Jesus himself, human. But you say, well then what about the 2011 NIV? For simply 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. You say, well, see, then the 2011 NIV is fine. They've gone back to King James Bible readings. We don't have to worry. It's not a conspiracy, right? Well, let's look at a few other verses here quickly. Uh, the 2011 NIV retains the TNIV human and abandons the old NIV man in the following verses. If you go back to 1984, interesting number, um, for the NIV, a lot of times it said man. Okay, the TNIV changed man to human. And the new 2011 NIV, I didn't go over the whole list. I have all this stuff collated from years ago, work that I did. But uh, I didn't go over the whole thing. I just kind of went through a couple chapters quick. Uh, Job 28.28 28 says human instead of man. Job 35, 8, Psalm 60, verse 11, Psalm 94, 11, Psalm 144, verse 3, Proverbs 16, 1, Proverbs 18, 14. And uh, it's interesting, Proverbs 20, verse 27, and Ecclesiastes 3, 21, the uh, King James Bible says the spirit of man, you know, the spirit of man, which is in man or whatever. The new NIV says the human spirit thought oh a <laughs> little bit of a difference there um isaiah 2 22 isaiah 31 8 both human replacing man ezekiel 10 14 a cherub with the face of a human being instead of a man hmm romans 1 23 romans 2 3 romans 3 4 romans 9 20 galatians 1 11 first thessalonians 4 8 hebrews 8 2 James 5.17, 2 Peter 1.21, Revelation 21.17. All of those places, the 2011 NIV kept the TNIV readings and actually went against the old NIV. So don't tell me that there's no agenda behind these new versions. You look at it, the King James Bible in 1611 was first printed. Okay, They used a very old printing process. The old printing press with the handset type. They had to do it backwards. I have a video on that. And there were errors. Okay, I mean, you, you try printing a whole Bible, putting each letter of each word in backwards, and then you know doing the printing press thing where you put the paper in, then you pull the handle and all that stuff. You try doing that without making a mistake. I mean, and but see, the 1611 authorized version it went through a purification process and it got more and more pure they corrected spelling errors they corrected misprints until in 1769 we have the king james bible that we use today see it was purified but the new versions you look at them and they came out and they read in many places they'll read similar to the king james bible but through the process of time they depart more and more and more and more and more away from the King James Bible. Away from just common sense readings. You know? See, it's not purification with the new versions. It's perversion. They get worse through time. Okay. Uh, by the way, too, I just want to make a, another little thing here. Uh, well, two things, actually. Judges 9, 9, and 13... The King James Bible says God and man, capital G, God and man. The 2011 NIV says gods and humans. <laughs> Which one do you want to be part of? Sorry, I'm going to go over to the God and man side there. I don't want to be part of the gods and humans. And by the way, the 1984 NIV, the old NIV, also said humans in different areas. Okay, different passages. So it's not that, well, now, you know, they say human, but they didn't in the past. No, they always did. Okay, they were always corrupt. Okay, now, uh, your vocabulary should be based on the King James Bible. And it doesn't mean that you have to go around talking like the King James Bible is written. 
Okay, you don't have to do that. But the point is, if there are words that you're using and they don't have a basis in Scripture, you know, a good example would be Trinity. You know, people say the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Yeah, but you can show it clearly from Scripture. You know, if you don't, if you have a problem saying Trinity, say Godhead. You know, no big deal. Go to First John five seven, clearest verse in the New Testament on the Godhead. Okay, that's why the new versions took it out. But uh, you know, your your language should be based on the Bible. And when you start saying words that are actually being used by the occultists and the politically correct world, you know, bad, really, really bad. Okay, now we went over a bunch of words there. Now we're actually going to go to some scriptures. Uh, I don't like to preach sermons without turning places in your Bible. We're going to look at some verses that are taken out of context and misunderstood. So go first to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Have you ever heard the thing people say that you have to pray without repetition? You know, and you'll get that. I remember I went through a, a time there where I was like, I'd pray and I'd think I have to pray about the same thing. I'd go, wait a second, I can't pray with repetition. So I have to, you know, I have to say it differently and I'll change it. We're going to see about this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. It says here, And when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Uh, you want to attend a national prayer day there, by the way? I don't think so. <laughs> Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Of uh, Quick note there. Your father knoweth what things ye have want of. No, it doesn't say want. It says need of. Okay? He knows what you need before you even ask for it. Okay? And what's it say back in James? Ye have not because ye ask not. Okay? If you need something, don't be afraid to ask the Lord for it. All right? Ask the Lord. But now, does the Scripture here teach that you cannot pray with repetition. No. It says vain repetition. Exactly. Vain repetition. Alright. Um, I'll read a verse here. We aren't going to turn there. Matthew chapter 26 verse 44. Speaking about Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time. Saying the same words. Jesus prayed with repetition. Okay, if you have a lost loved one or lost somebody that you work with or whatever, we'll say Jim, and you say, Lord, I pray that Jim gets saved. I, I really am concerned for his soul. Next day, you know, Lord, I pray. Oh, yeah. Um, Lord, I uh, do ask that Jim might come to salvation. No, 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 no. You can pray the same things. That's not what's being condemned there in Matthew chapter 6. It's vain repetition. Okay, well, what are vain repetitions? Well, I have here my Sunday Missal. Okay, <laughs> this is a Catholic prayer book. And you go through here, and it's got different prayers for different Sundays. And, you know, after Mass, you're to say this prayer and all this stuff. Yeah. And then here we have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. And if you ever want to refute Catholics, get this one. I've I've gotten into different debates with Catholics over the years. They hate this catechism. <laughs> but it's got the imprimatur of the archbishop and everything. And I think it's either this one. No, I don't I guess it's not this one. Uh No. There's the uh No. The the newest uh catechism, well not newest, 2001 was actually the imprimatur was by Cardinal Ratzinger, the current pope. So they can't deny that thing. But this one here, this has got the official seal of the Catholic Church. But some of the stuff in here is just ridiculous. And I've gotten in debates with Catholics and I say, hey, what about this here? 
we don't believe that way. <laughs> I'm like, yes, you do. It's right in there. Sorry. But it says here, <clears throat> um, prayer to the Holy Spirit. Okay, it says, let us pray. O God, who did, didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Well, guess what? I'm real lucky. I just got an indulgence of five years for saying that. Right. <laughs> so I got five years less in time in purgatory to worry about. Yeah. And they got they got all this different stuff in here, you know. You can get three years out of purgatory, you know, if you do this here. <laughs> really quite ridiculous but the point is they get these prayers and they will repeat them and repeat them and repeat them and repeat them i remember brian donovan the one time another king james bible believer a preacher you know down in florida and he was talking about how he was raised catholic and he said he would he would go someplace and he'd get down on his knees you know in a closet or whatever and he would he would pray the hail mary thing he'd pray that thing for hours just repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. You know why? Because he was scared about purgatory. And the more of that stuff you pray, the Catholic Church teaches, the less time you'll have to burn. What a warped way of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? It's vain repetition being prayed by heathen. They're not Christians. They're not saved. And they're just repeating it, repeating it, repeating it. You know, another one that's very popular among people who think that they're saved is this thing of they, they sit down, they say, uh, um, oh, I can't think how the thing gets started. I've heard people pray it. Um, God is great. God is good. And we thank him for our food. Give us, us this day our daily bread. And, and I always forget the rest of it. Help us not fall on our head or something. I don't know. You know, but the point is they repeat it and they repeat it and they repeat it. I mean, I used to know a guy. I used to hang out with a guy in high school, and, and his dad, he'd say, okay, you know, go over and let's, let's pray. God is great. God is good. And we thank him for our food. It was just like, what is this? I mean, how would you feel if I came to you and you said, hey, how are you doing? I am good. How are you? Hope you're fine. Got to go. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be like, hey, that's great. You know, how do you think the Lord feels? The Lord doesn't want to hear your vain repetitions. He wants to hear from you. He wants to know what you have need of. He knows what you need, but he wants you to ask him for it. Okay? So don't, that's one that you don't want to fall for the thing of, that you have to mix up your words every time you pray. You don't. Okay? If you are praying something sincerely, if you have somebody specific, don't worry about saying the same words. Okay? Worry about vain repetition. And by the way, you say, well, I'll never, never be guilty of that. I don't have a missile. I don't have a catechism. But you can start to fall into that vain repetition thing. Mm -hmm. You fool around. You do a whole bunch of stuff that you want to do throughout the day. And then you give the Lord just, you know, 30 seconds before you go to bed. And you're kind of tired. And you say, oh, God, you know, thank you for the day. Um, thank you that we have the Bible. Thank you for salvation. Uh, help us to have a good sleep and blah, blah, blah. It can start to become vain. You can start repeating stuff, and I'll, I'll do that. I'll just stop midstream right in a prayer and just say, I'm not concentrating, Lord. Just give me a minute. You know, I've got to get my thoughts together here, you know. Watch out for vain repetition, but don't worry about repeating yourself. Okay, how about the thing of call no man a fool? I've, I've heard that. I say, man, that guy's a fool. Well, the Bible says call no man a fool. Really? Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22 says here, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, remember that, <laughs> shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Okay, now think about a couple things here. First of all, it wouldn't have made sense for the Lord to keep saying without a cause, without a cause, without a cause. He clearly identifies it. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, and then what comes after that? The things that you say to your brother. Okay? If you have a cause, it's okay to be angry. And we're going to see about that here. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 17 through 19. We're not going to turn there. If you want to, you can. But I'm just going to read it here quickly. It says, this is Jesus. 
by the way, in Matthew chapter 23, the Jesus of Matthew 23 is a Jesus that is foreign to the average modern professing Christian. I actually read a devotional book by a woman the one time in my research, and she said, when you read through Matthew 23, it almost is like this is a different Jesus speaking. And it's like, well, guess what, lady? It is a different Jesus than the one you know. Because your Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. It says here, Matthew 23, verse 17, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold, and whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Uh, so there you have Jesus calling these men, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, he's calling them fools. So you have Jesus saying, Luke twelve twenty, uh, But God said unto him, Thou fool! This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Talking to a rich man. And he says, thou fool. So Jesus called men fools. God called a man a fool. 1 Corinthians 15, 36. And people say, well, that's Jesus. You know, He could do it because he knew. You know, Okay, let's look about this. I've had people say that to me. Though, you know. I'll say, well, Jesus called people fools. Well, that's because he's God. You know, <laughs> like we can't. You know. You know, they'll, they'll say, you shouldn't call people fool. That wouldn't be Christ-like. <laughs> but yeah, 1 Corinthians fifteen thirty six. Paul says, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. Okay? Now, as I said, what is the key to Matthew five twenty two? It's without a cause. Don't just go around and say, that guy's a fool if you don't have a cause. All right? And I've had, you know, new version people, you know, these modern loving Christians. I've had them call me a fool because of my stand for the King James Bible. They didn't have a cause. You know, it's interesting. Most of the attacks that I do on the new versions, the exposés that I do on the new versions, there are very few people that are refuting them. And it's not because I'm intelligent or got some kind of special talent that people can't come after or something. That's not it. It's that it's the truth. And people don't like the truth, and so what they do is they attack me. Okay? That's, that's what's going to happen. If you stand for the truth, people, when they can't refute it, they'll come after you. They'll attack you. And they'll oftentimes call you a fool, and they don't have a cause. There's no cause for them saying that. Okay, but the three there. Jesus had a cause for calling the scribes and Pharisees fools. God had a cause for calling the rich man a fool. And Paul, if you look at the, the context of 1 Corinthians 15, it's about the resurrection. And somebody was complaining, saying, you know, with what body do they rise and stuff like that. You know, people thinking that the dead, you know, they're going to rise up like they were. And Paul says, thou fool, you know, <laughs> you're not very smart. You know, the Lord's going to take care of that stuff. Okay, so can you call people a fool if you have a cause? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, the Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. You know what God's description of an atheist is? It says that guy's a fool. You know? Well, we need to be respectful of their beliefs. No, you don't. No, you don't. No nope. Some guy comes along, I don't believe there is a God. Well, you're a fool. You have a cause, and it lines up with Scripture. It's the way it is. Now, what about the other one? Turn the other cheek. We'll hear another one like that, you know. We're here to turn the other cheek. Well, let's look at that scripture. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, verse 38. Okay, it says here, Ye have heard that it hath been said, An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist... See, let me just say this real quick before we continue. Jesus is not saying that was wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was wrong back in the Old Testament, and that you know I'm correcting it. He didn't say that. He said it was said back then. But I say to you, see, he's saying it's not wrong back then what the Lord told those people. But I'm saying now to you, I'm going to change some things. Okay, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, we have here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, 
quite a few groups that are into the pacifist thing. And this is one of their key doctrinal verses. And they'll take this, and then they'll go back to Isaiah, where it says about beating your sword into plowshare and your spear into a pruning hook. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall men learn war anymore. All that stuff. It's interesting because the United Nations puts that on the front of their building. You know, kind of weird. But uh, the Mennonites, the Amish, charity ministries, there are a lot of groups that are pacifist, and they will use these scriptures to say that if somebody is beating you up, threatening you, raping your wife, molesting your children, you just sit there and take it. And we had a guy say that the one time, one of these charity ministries guys. Yeah. Uh, Brother Marty, the one time, he said to the guy, he said, he said, what would you do if some guy broke in and raped your wife? He said, he said I would pray for the man. No, how about praying to the Lord and saying, give me the strength to beat the snot out of this guy. <laughs> Kick him out of the home. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, but uh, are there some teachings like this in the Pauline epistles? First Timothy 3.3 3 says, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Okay, a Christian, now let's speak specifically about a bishop, but a Christian shouldn't go out looking for fights. Okay, don't be a brawler, don't be a striker. If somebody hits you in the face, don't let it turn into a fight. Don't let it turn into a bad thing. Okay? Now, think about something. If somebody slaps you in the face because you're out preaching or witnessing or whatever else, is that life-threatening? No. <laughs> okay? Now, for the police, the police have some good concepts to them. You know, you have Romans 13 there that where the police are given to protect the good. They're not a terror to, to the good. And when they start becoming a terror of the good, they're no longer proper police. You have to define things, you know. But the point is, the police have some good training, some good concepts that they're supposed to live by. Supposed to live by. <laughs> if a cop is slapped in the face, does that give them the right to pull their service revolver out and shoot the person? Negative. No. <laughs> what do they call that? They call it escalation of force. Okay? Somebody's yelling at you. Don't taser them. Okay, a lot of them do, but it's because they got a you know an attitude problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've seen some good cops occasionally. You know, you watch cops or whatever like that. You know, I don't anymore, but I used to. And you'd see occasionally you'd see some guy screaming and yelling at a cop, and the cops just calm and he collected and just, sir, you need to pray, take your voice down. That's a good police officer. Okay, and I've seen them even sometimes they get slapped in the face and they don't. You know, well, I'm going to get, you know, they just, they grab the person, they subdue them. Okay? That's all the Bible's teaching there. If somebody slaps you in the face, just don't let it turn into a fight. Okay? There's a, a preacher that we knew the one time, uh, um, James Lyman. And he was out street preaching the one time, and a woman got mad and came up to him, and she slapped him so hard in the face that it knocked his glasses off. You know? Do you think he fought her? No. And you know what happened? There was a police officer standing a little ways away and he saw it happen. He came over and he arrested the woman. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's a good police officer. Very good. Defending the rights of a citizen. Okay? Not even wouldn't not even say the Christian thing. You know, I mean that's good that he defended a Christian, but the point is he was doing his duty. Very good. Okay, all the Bible's trying to teach there all the lord jesus is trying to teach there is not that you should be an effeminate sissy that gets walked all over he's just saying if somebody slaps you in the face don't hit them back okay just take it take a little bit of suffering for the lord i mean look at paul look at the apostle paul he was beaten numerous times for his witness did he raise up an army and go in and fight against the soldiers you know or or get a bow and arrow and snipe or attack the soldier or something no <laughs> You know, he took it. Sometimes there are, are things that you should take like that. And, you know, we're headed into some times right now where we might get beat up for the Lord. If your life is not at stake, you might have to take some stuff. Okay? But if your life is being threatened and you have a wife and kids or family or whoever. Congregation. Yeah. Anybody. Christian brothers and sisters, 
Anybody like that and somebody's going to kill you? That's a different story. They're not slapping you in the face, okay? And they're trying to kill you. That's a different situation. Luke chapter 22, verse 36 through 38 says, Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise also, or likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Verse 37, For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished to me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they so said, Lord, Behold, here are two swords, and he said unto them, It is enough. Okay, First Timothy 5, 8 says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Okay, a man is supposed to provide money, and shelter, and clothing for his wife and kids. But if he's doing that, and not providing safety, he doesn't have the whole thing down. A man is to provide everything, okay, and safety is part of it. Let me tell you a little story which I've told before. Um, this disgusting pervert, uh, Charlie Roberts, I think was his name, and he went down to an Amish school here probably about, what, two years ago, something like that, and he went down there to rape and molest these little Amish girls. And before he got done, you know, the, the police showed up and he ended up killing a whole bunch of those little girls and then he killed himself. And you say, oh, that's terrible. Yeah, but the story doesn't uh, end there. You see, the fact is, this guy was a milk truck driver. And he was going around to these Amish farms, and there were times when he was trying to molest these Amish girls. You see, it had been going on before. And, but you see, the Amish are pacifists. So the Amish won't call the police. And the Amish men won't fight off a pervert like that. And that's why it happened. Because he could see, these people aren't going to report me. So I can do this and get away with it. And right down the road here, a couple doors down, we have a child molester. A convicted child molester. Last house on our road here. Convicted child molester. And he is free. He's walking around free. He's not in prison. You don't want to know why? Because the boys that he molested were Amish boys. And so it comes to court and the Amish men says... I'm going to turn the cheek, the other cheek. I'm not going to have this guy arrested. I'm not going to press charges. I want to show him love. You see what that is? That's perversion of Scripture. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's disgusting. How people twist the Scriptures. They have misconceptions about the Scripture. And because of that, some dirty perverts walking around. You better hope he doesn't try to molest any kids that I know of. Because I will stop him. Uh, look, by the way, at Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. Uh, we're going to see about this thing of this, this, uh, these people that try to follow Matthew chapter 5. Which, by the way, the Sermon on the Mount was given by Jesus to the Jewish people. And if they would have accepted Him as their Messiah, these are more laws for the Millennial Kingdom which is coming. But look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 40 through 42. They'll take the thing about turning the other cheek, but then you drop down here and they won't do this. Uh, it says here, And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Um, and give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Yeah, they're going to follow that one. Uh-huh. No, they won't. Walk up to an Amishman and say, Hey, I'd, I'd like to borrow a $1,000. I don't know you. You know, I, how do I know that you're going to pay me? Well, hey, buddy, right there it says, From him that would borrow thee, turn not thou away. I'm here. While I'm here, hey, why not $10,000? You know? Oh, you mean you're going to follow, turn the other cheek and pervert that, but you're not going to follow this? Mm hmm. Yeah. See, these scriptures here are given to the Jewish people. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in just a minute or two. But these are given to the Jewish people for a time, the millennial kingdom, when Jesus Christ is ruling the earth and his saints are ruling with him and Satan is bound and in the bottomless pit. It's a different time. That's why there's no war. 
Okay, that's why you can be somewhat of a pacifist in that time period. Satan's bound <laughs> and in the bottomless pit. Different situation. Okay, now let's go on to the fourth thing here. Then we'll have one more after that. But the fourth one. Here's another famous one that you'll hear. Freely have received, freely give. You'll hear that one. Now, if you're in ministry, you should be giving everything away for free. You know, no man should ever sell anything or try to make any money from ministry. You'll hear that. I've been, you know, given that one a couple times. You know, I should just produce videos, print the DVDs, go through all the expense, and then put them on my website for free. You know, magically, I don't know where the money's supposed to come from to pay for this stuff, but, you know, just give it away for free. That's what you're told. They'll quote that verse, throw it in your face. But let's actually look at the verse. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. You know, you have this thing, paid ministry is a sin. And I'll compare you to Benny Hinn and all this stuff. If I was making the kind of money that Benny Hinn's making, yeah, maybe it would be a sin. <laughs> but you do what's right, you aren't going to even come close to that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Uh, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils? I uh, haven't done that recently. <laughs> but you see, you just ignore that and you just go with the last line there, right? You know, uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Let's look at the context here of this verse. Jump up to verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, huh? and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is for us today. Read the context. He's talking to Jews, and he's saying, Don't go to the Gentiles. But I thought Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Hmm. Is this a contradiction? Well, if you're non-dispensational, yes, it is. But if you rightly divide the word of truth as you're commanded to in 2 Timothy 2.15, it's not a contradiction. You look and you say, okay, this is pre-crucifixion. All right? This is before Jesus died on the cross. He had to first come and offer himself as the Jewish Messiah to the people of Israel. They rejected him. He couldn't just come and say, okay, I'm here for everybody. Oh, the Jews, yeah, well, whatever. You know, He couldn't do that. He had to offer himself as their Messiah, as their promised Messiah. And that's what's going on right here. And the kingdom of heaven? Did you know that there's only one book in the Bible where that term is mentioned? Only one? And it's the book of Matthew? Okay. The kingdom of heaven, without getting into a huge study on it, I've done it in other sermons, the kingdom of heaven is the physical kingdom on the earth with Jerusalem as the city of the king, the great king. Okay, it's the physical kingdom down here. People see kingdom of heaven, they think of heaven where God's at. Okay, not so. All right, I can't get into all the other scriptures um, on that, but the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom down here. Um, but that's the gospel that they were preaching. And that gospel is going to come back eventually towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble whole other study. Uh, but jump down to verse uh, 9. You say that, you know, well, these guys, they weren't getting paid for their ministry. Let's look about that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 9. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Hmm. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Were they getting paid? Oh, room and board. Yeah, they were. Okay? All that Jesus Christ was saying there is not that a minister should not be paid. He's just simply saying, you Jews that are going out, 
don't go out and charge money for this. Okay, don't go out and say, you know, the preaching sermon will start, you know, when we raise $500 or something. Don't do that. That's all Jesus is saying there. He's not condemning any kind of paid ministry. And by the way, you'd have to ignore a lot of other scriptures that talk about ministers being paid. Okay? That's the way it is. Can you abuse the system of preaching to get rich? Well, of course. You know, I mean... The way we're doing it here, this is not a good way to get rich. You know, <laughs> the best way to get rich is to go out and get a 501c3 corporation and make yourself the CEO of it and tell people what they want to hear, give them the world and draw them in. You can make a killing. I mean, there are preachers that are making millions of dollars a year in this country. You know why? Because they're ministers of Satan. You know, it's the way it is. So this thing of freely you have received, freely give, it's not condemned in Scripture. Okay, you don't use that little, not even the whole verse. Don't use that little sentence there out of context. Okay, don't fall for that thing. Now finally, the last one, call no man father. This is another one that you'll hear. People say you should never use the word father. Well, let's look about that. Matthew chapter 23, verse 8. Matthew chapter 23, verse 8 through 10. It says here, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. And so many of the brethren, they say, yeah, I was over at my mother and uh, um, dad's house. You know, you know. Uh, yeah, me and my father, oh, uh, um, old man, uh, we went out the other day. You know, or maybe it was parents or something. Is that what's being said here? No. Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve, the Ten Commandments: Honor thy father and mother. Okay, you can use the word father. Um, Genesis chapter twenty-two. Verse 7 and 8 says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them uh, together. Okay, there's a prophecy there in verse 8. But the point is, uh, Isaac called Abraham his father. Okay, um, James chapter two verse twenty one relates back to this. It says, "Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar?" What's being condemned there in Matthew chapter twenty three verse eight through ten? What's being condemned? Your earthly father, or a title, a religious title? Did you know that there aren't supposed to be any religious titles in Christianity? The Bible says that you're to honor, you know, the bishop, the elder of the church, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Honor is fine. But you don't honor them with an honorary title or a doctorate. And how far we've gotten away from that, from that whole system. I mean, look at the context there in Matthew chapter 23. You have rabbi, you have master, you have father. Okay? Those are three different titles. And you're not supposed to use those. According to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what's being said there. And again, you know, why is there a church that says that they're the one true church and, and they call their pedophile priests, they call them father? You know, they're not fathers. I mean, think of how ridiculous that is. They can't have children. They're celibate. You know, why would you call them father? See? No, it doesn't work. Don't use these honorary titles for men. Psalm 111, verse 9. Here's another one. Uh, he sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. Did you know reverend is a title for God? Why would you call a sinner reverend? And it gets even worse than that. How about these people? You see these these Lutherans and stuff like that, and they call themselves most reverend. You know, what are you, above God or something? 
or very reverend. You know, or some of these guys. I mean, I, I saw the one that was like some pervert Catholic or something. He was like the, the holy most high reverend father or something. It's like, what is this? Guy's not even saved. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Worshipful master or something. You know, it's just incredible. Okay? You can call your birth father, you can call him father. Okay? You don't have to say dad or, or some other name. You know, those titles aren't bad. I'm just saying, you know, don't fall for some of those things. But, uh, and there's a lot more misconceptions we could get into. The thing of angels, you know, that are winged sexless beings or something. No, they're not. They're men. You know, the Bible says some have entertained angels unawares. You know, you could have an angel in your midst and you wouldn't be able to tell anything different, you know. <laughs> uh, another one, of course, which I talked about earlier, is the thing of Satan doesn't run hell. You know, another one that you'll hear people say, that's a lie out of hell. Well, I understand the concept there, but it goes back to that same thing of Satan running hell and that, and that he's like got a control room down there and he sends out deception. No, it doesn't work. Anybody that's in hell is no longer deceived. And actually truth is coming out of hell. Yep. The rich man and Lazarus, the rich man is saying, send Lazarus back and warn my brethren. He isn't down there in hell saying, I don't really think hell exists. You know, I, I think this is not, it's just the grave and it's, you know, uh, he knows the truth. Okay. Be careful what you repeat is all I'm trying to say by this message. Okay. Um, now we're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to hit three more places in the Bible and then we're done for today. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15. And uh, I don't know if you noticed or not, but what book did all of those scripture misconceptions come from? Matthew. Matthew. The book of Matthew is a book that you're going to have to be very careful when you go through it. You need to rightly divide it. There's a lot in that book uh, that doesn't apply to you today doctrinally. The whole Bible applies to you for instruction in righteousness, for reproof, for correction. But doctrine, you need to be real careful. Okay, and you say, well, I don't understand. You know, the, every chapter in the book is mine. Uh, no, not exactly. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It says here, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death... For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, there you have the Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Question. When did the New Testament begin? After the death of Jesus on the cross. Yeah. So, when did Jesus die on the cross in the book of Matthew? Did he die in Matthew chapter 1? No. It wasn't until the 28th chapter. Okay, 27th he's basically on the cross. But the point is, most of the book of Matthew is doctrinally written to the Jews. And people say, well, then you can't read any of it. Then it's no good for us. No, 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 no. You can go back and you can get a lot out of the book of Matthew. You can get a lot out of the Gospels. But you have to be very careful when you go back there for doctrine. Okay, there's a lot about the Jews and their and their customs and their traditions that I don't understand. You know, I wish I did sometimes. But I'm not going to start acting, trying to act like I'm a Jew, you know, whatever. I'm a Christian in the church age. I'm supposed to know the Pauline epistles. That's where your main doctrine comes from. I'm a Gentile. Okay, I'm a Gentile Christian. I don't go around calling myself that. I just call myself a Christian. You know, but the point is, be very careful about where you're getting your doctrine from. And when people go back to the book of Matthew and they start getting their main core doctrines, you're running into trouble. That's why a lot of these people, that's, you know, there's a, a book uh, by Noah Hutchings uh, called um, Why So Many Churches. And the main reason is because people don't rightly divide the word of truth. The Amish, the Mennonites, the charity ministry people around here, they take most of their truth from the Sermon on the Mount, which wasn't even written to them. And because of that, they get messed up. So be very careful where you're getting your doctrine. 
Okay, Second Timothy two fifteen. Go there yet? Just a couple chapters before, or a couple books, excuse me, before Hebrews. Second Timothy two fifteen. And this is not a suggestion. This is a command in Scripture. There's a lot of commands. They say, oh, we don't have to keep the commandments. You know, there are a lot of commandments in the Pauline epistles that you're supposed to keep. Mm -hmm. And here's one of them. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Did you know that the truth is divisive? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. The truth is divisive. Okay? Well, what happens if you don't divide? You become a shame before the Lord. You go through the Bible and you got stuff all messed up and you're throwing things around and saying stuff that has no basis in Scripture for you. Okay? You don't rightly divide the word of truth. You become a workman that needs to be ashamed. I've said this before in another study, and I'll just repeat it one more time because it's good illustration. It's like when you go to a big store like a Lowe's or a Home Depot or something, some place that has a huge amount of things, and you go up to some kid that's working there, you know, summer job, which he could care less about, and you say, where are the screwdrivers? Uh, uh I think they're over, uh, you know, I'll have to ask the manager. No, I'll just go find them myself. <laughs> well, that's the same way it is for a Christian. Hey, what's the plan of salvation? Uh, I think it's in Matthew. Um, uh, and you'll have people that are like that. What's the plan of salvation? Anything from Matthew to Revelation? No, it isn't. No, it isn't. You got to be real careful about that stuff. Hey, what does the Bible say about this? Or what does the Bible say about that? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed will know what the right divisions of Scripture are. Oh, you want to hear about marriage? Okay, Come here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll go over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. What about the resurrection? Oh, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here, right here. Uh, what about uh, eternal security? Okay, we'll turn over here to Ephesians chapter 4. Okay? And you say, well, that sounds like it's going to take work. The word right there is study. Which has been removed from all the modern Bibles, by the way. That's right. Study. Study takes time. <laughs> <laughs> just the way it is you want to do something for the Lord that's going to take you some time last place to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 you say oh, I, you know, I just don't I'm not going to fight about word differences well why don't you read this verse here hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This King James Bible right here is a great, great thing that is committed to, to your trust as a Christian. This thing is not just 400 years old. Okay, you go back to other languages, to other groups of Christians. I'm not talking about Protestants. I'm talking about Bible-believing Christians, the Waldensian people, the Huguenots, the you know, there were a lot of people, group, groups of Christians that are not even known by most people. This is the book that was committed to them, and they kept it, and they preserved it, and the Lord was with them, and He helped them to preserve it. You know, it's a it's a ridiculous thing to think that God inspired the original autographs and then He lost it since then. That's nonsense. If your God can't preserve a book, what in the world are you worshiping Him for? You know, I mean, give me a break. This book right here has been passed down and passed down and passed down. Even just the King James Bible. Go back a hundred years ago. This is what the Christians were using. Hold fast the form of sound words in your King James Bible. Be, no. Be careful when people come and try to take these words away from you. And I don't just mean the King James Bible. I mean the language. When they start saying to you, you know what, I'm offended by that term man. You shouldn't be saying man. It should be human. Don't call yourself a man. And, and what's this congregation thing? That's offensive to the lost. It should be community. You know, a big ministry, ministry if you will, here in America, Campus Crusade for Christ. 
They recently just came out and said, we're dropping the name Christ because it goes contrary to the mission that we're trying to accomplish. See you later, Campus Crusade. I'll have nothing to do with you. Bye. You know, there was another story. They they used to have uh, um, signs that they'd put out in front of churches before revival meetings. And I uh, can't think about it, but it, what the exact words were, but it was something about they had Jesus Christ on there. And then they took it down to Christ. Or no, it was Jesus Christ is the answer. Mm-hmm. And then it went to Christ is the answer. And now it's this is the answer. And now churches, they don't even put them out anymore. See, the two different things that you can see there, Christianity is, it gets preservation, okay? There's there's a preserving, a, a purification process. Satan, it's perversion. Things get worse, okay, with time. This book here says you're to hold fast. You know what that means? People say, oh, you're stubborn. You're not willing to change. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I'm not going to, you're not going to take this book from me. It's not going to happen. And I'm going to work hard to keep my speech in line with this book. And I'm going to examine the things that I'm saying and the things that are coming out of my mouth. I'm going to say, wait a second, you know, this human thing, that's just recent. And I'm starting to say, you know, maybe I shouldn't be repeating that word. You know, and you need to do that as a Christian. Okay? Everything that you do needs to be checked out with this book. And a good thing that you can do too, by the way, is not just the book, but, you know, the things Paul wrote about to Timothy, actually right down there in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There should be a line of succession. If you look back at the powerful movements of the past couple hundred years when this book was the only book out there, a lot of that stuff, you need to be doing the same things. Okay, you don't abandon what worked in the past. You know, well, I could just keep on going on and on and on, but we'll close for today. Um, Actually, I'm going to close with a word of prayer here. Uh, So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Uh, more than anything, for your word. For without your word, Lord, what would salvation be? Salvation would be what every man thinks is right in his own mind, in his own heart. And uh, 1 John chapter 5 talks about the written record of your Son, and how that we can know that we are saved because we have a written record, which has been passed down through countless centuries. And the Christians that have died and the blood that has been shed so that we could have this book right here, And Lord, your word says that in the future, in the coming time of Jacob's trouble, that there would be Christians that are going to be slain again for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. So it's going to come back, Lord. People are going to have to die for your word, your written word. And I just pray for the people out there that they would check everything against the King James Bible, that they would understand this issue, how important it is, that they would see the danger of the new versions, that these new versions aren't just a... a, a harmless thing, they are very harmful. They're trying to take away the form of sound words that you've committed to our keeping. And so I just pray, Lord, that if there are any people out there that are hearing this message, that uh, if they don't know about the Bible version issue, I pray that they would get in contact with us, that they would search this issue out, pray about it, Lord, because you'll you'll uh, lead them into the truth. And so I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.